Hello, Mr. Oh. Hey, uh, so it's uh, 3.30. Oh, so I guess, we, so there's, just before we start, there's another question in chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sank Sanket, do you want to ask? Or do you want me to ask? Okay, maybe I can ask. Mm -hmm. So the fluctuations that leave the Hubble radius uh, and re-enter in the late universe, how can they generate primordial black holes if they can? So, uh, <laughs> the question again? so the question is which basically which modes uh, can can uh, cause uh, can uh, generate primordial black holes? Yeah, well, it's essentially any any modes. <laughs> I mean, as long as it doesn't uh, it, uh, has a contradict with the current observations. So, uh, so let's say uh, again. Okay, so my okay. Yeah, how to do this, uh, how to... But, okay, but, the, but also the question is how can they generate primordial black holes? <laughs> this is quite a big topic, I think. But... Well, uh, if you, yeah, uh, okay, so so then then I, sh I should just say maybe I will uh, answer this question tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I mean, so so, uh, so this since the primordial black will be the uh, topic, I will be talking, uh, yeah, tomorrow, probably. Okay. Yes, second part, final part. Yeah, so, uh, so if you could wait until that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that okay? <laughs> Sorry. I think that's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess we can start uh, the next lecture if you can, when you're ready, Misa. I'm ready, okay. So, okay, let's start. So, so now the... Uh, so we, we discuss how the fluctuations are generated. Now, as we all know, I, I when when you learn say quantum field theory or maybe some basic quantum field theory that the, a, any quantum field or even the quantum mechanics, uh, you, a system is associated with the so-called vacuum fluctuations, uh, which is because of the uh, uh, uncertainty principle, and so. Uh, in our case, the, uh, the scale field, <coughs> uh, the interacting field, it, it also has some fluctuations, and, and these fluctuations will have some vacuum fluctuations. So let's assume, uh, a, so, so here, so I, I just wrote it in this uh, very simple form, but uh, so this, in, in reality, it will be an operator given by some uh, Mode function, so called mode function, which is function of time times uh, a, a, a annihilation operator. Yes, and, and then uh, you have the creation operator, which is the other, and the star. Star, something like this. So, so so this it is represented that part. And, and here the important point is this mode function. And, and uh, this is the same, the, the equation for the mode function. Now, if you assume the, the infrared field uh, has sufficiently flat potential, which we assume that this uh, the eta parameter, uh, it is in, in Planck units, Potential, sorry, <laughs> this square v. Uh, this is very small, uh, and and this this implies this if you if you just assume this v square to be m square, uh, and this and in in the uh, Planck unit potential is essentially the Hubble parameter, so it's or maybe just like this v, but it's okay. Anyway, this. If this is very small, then at leaving all the approximation, you can consider this as a massless field. <clears throat> now, so and and the, so massless field and mode function behaves like this. So you have the uh, a delta phi double dot plus again the expand the due to the expansion of the universe, you have the friction time plus. The, uh, the effective potential term, which is just given by k square over a square. 
right? <coughs> of course, uh, for a fixed commoving wave number k, this decreases exponentially during the uh, sorry, inflationary, inflationary universe. So uh, in the beginning, when this was this effect omega square, the frequency, physical frequency is large, then you can ignore the uh, uh, Hubble parameter and, and then uh, you have some this curvature. This is this will be omega squared curvature. And, and uh, you have some oscillatory behavior here, oscillatory behavior. But as this goes down and, and the, the, when the scale becomes this essentially the effect H becomes uh, greater than omega, then this friction becomes dominating and this stops oscillating and then this starts slowly goes down the hill. And so that's what happens. <clears throat> and, and, and then uh, uh, before it reaches, I mean, it's, this is random phase, so you, you don't really know where, where your, your, your fluctuation is, but when, when this becomes negligible, then as you can see that essentially this equal to zero means that the delta phi becomes a constant. So, so, um, so in the end, a, a, you, you, will, you will have some uh, amplitude of fluctuations which frozen on super horizon scale. And, and, and this essentially happens same to the gravitational wave modes uh, or so-called tensor modes because the tensor modes are massless modes. So, uh, but in any case, uh, the, the whole point is that in the beginning they are oscillating, but uh, in the end uh, they, they stop oscillating and frozen at certain value. And this mean value of, can be, of, of course, computed a, a, a fairly e approximate it very easily <coughs> so, uh, like this. So so this is how you uh, estimate. First, if you consider this MOS, uh, which is, uh, as I said, that this is the essentially the uh, media so that used to uh, uh, V, but anyway, so you have, as I said, each mode will be given by a annihilation and creation operator, uh, so in this case it will be phi plus a k, uh, so it's, it's minus k, data phi bar, essentially. And, and, and uh, if you uh, sort of take the, the uh, mod k, which is a, a k. So if you one particle state, if you if you uh, how to say we take the expectation value of this is one particle state, then you get this pi. So it's square is pi square. This is the uh, so called uh, 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 the mod function. And in the, uh, the, the early universe, when, when the uh, scale is much, much uh, smaller than horizon scale, then, then you can always consider the expansion universe to be adiabatic. Then you obtain this formula. Uh, this is the standard sort of a positive frequency function in the, uh, uh, the flat space. Uh, or uh, in uh, a, a cosmological case, this, this is called adiabatic vacuum mode function. Uh, I cannot write very well. <laughs> adiabatic vacuum mode function. Anyway, and, and it's, it's apart from the scale factor dependence, this is exactly what you have in, in the flat space. Now, this is valid when uh, this uh, the effective frequency, um, uh, frequency omega in k over h is much greater than Hubble, so that the expansion of the universe can be ignored. 
Now, of course, this is a very a bold kind of a approximation, but you should assume this is valid until the, this this becomes equal to Hubble. So then, then you you just a uh, compute this amplitude of this a uh, uh, mode function at so-called horizon crossing time when the scale is equal to the Hubble horizon scale. Then you needed to see if you plug everything here and and uh, assume this uh, condition, then you find the final amplitude is given by this. Now, when the scale becomes out uh, smaller than when this becomes small than horizon, then I said say this amplitude freezes out. So essentially you have this freezing of, oh, by the way, yes, you have some random phase here. So you have to take the uh, mean value of this. But anyway, when when uh, you take the mean square value of this, then and, and multiply by the uh, the uh, this uh, what do you call this uh, uh, phase 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 uh, space uh, volume. Huh? If you multiply this phase space volume, then then you get the amplitude of delta phi square to be over the order of h over two pi at Time of the horizon crossing, and this will be frozen outside the horizon. So, <clears throat> so this is what happens. This is the sort of intuitive picture of the how the fluctuations arise. Some some kind of oh, by the way, so on super horizon scale, since this amplitude remains almost a constant and frozen, and in some sense, a uh, the fluctuation become classical. Because uh, the, you no longer have some uh, in, in indeterminacy due to this uncertainty principle, but essentially the amplitude and phase are well defined on supervising. Uh, and this is because of this local uh, causality. Locally, the uh, anything on scales greater than horizon is sort of a, cannot be oscillate because. Uh, they cannot have any causal contact uh, among certain scale. So, so which means that the, all the fluctuations become essentially classical. But anyway, the point is that now here, all this discussion, the intuitive discussion is based on minimizing metric perturbations. So, so you may consider that the, uh, this, after all, this, this is a very, very bad approximation and it may not uh, the uh, good one, but but they uh, are in on in con contrary to that kind of sort of a suspicion. Actually, uh, this turns out to be a very good approximation, at, at least in certain range of uh, scales. And the point is that there is indeed a gauge choice of our called the high the hyper time gauge, time size temporary gauge, uh, where the the metric perturbation minimized. And or in, in, in terms of a linear perturbation language, if you consider the perturbation on the intrinsic three-dimensional uh, curvature, then you can always choose a slice on which this curvature vanishes. This is called flat slice or flat slicing. Uh, for example, and, and then if, if you consider some purely homogeneous universe, this was the uh, a, uh, equation for the three-dimensional curvature. Now, for the perturbations with mod k, and if you if fully turn, uh, decompose this modes, then instead of this large k, you find a, a uh, this four k square over six times the sum curly r. So that this is the variable, uh, and. Then delta k or the curvature perturbation in some sense can be given in this form. Or if you go to the real space, actually it's minus two over three and Laplacian of, of uh, this uh, perturbation. And, and this is this is the real, I mean real space expression, but in any case, the point is that once you give this quantity. Then uh, a perturbation amplitude of the curvature is determined. 
So that's the reason why this is sort of called curvature propagation. And, and this uh, a slicing is called flat because you can choose this curvature propagation to vanish. Uh, and, and this is a choice of, uh, and because we have in the general relativity, you have this freedom to choose the, the uh, coordinates. You can choose the coordinates in such that the t called constant slice will be flat. So, and which means that the equation essentially becomes very, very much close to equations on a uh, uh, flat Minkowski space. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, in the expanding inverse, but uh, uh, which uh, uh, ignoring symmetric values. So, so, so this is the uh, sort of a kind of intuitive picture, but and the so important thing is that this fluctuation is given on this flat slice. But uh, as we all know, or maybe you know, you should know that, uh, for example, in the current universe, when we discuss physics, usually or local physics, we 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 use the sort of so-called Newtonian coordinate, or maybe in the uh, some other so cosmological situation, you may have some other coordinates to discuss physics. So flat slicing may not be a, a adequate slicing for cosmological purposes and actually may not have a much uh, intuitive picture for the, uh, when we discuss prediction of the curvature perturbation. And then, <coughs> yeah, uh, then it, we, we introduce so-called a, a co-moving <coughs> curvature perturbation. And co-moving means Instead of putting this uh, uh, spatial capacity to zero, you can now consider a, a slice on which a, a inflaton field is a, a, a constant or a, a homogeneous. Uh, remember that this, this scale field, uh, uh, there was a case in a simplest model, uh, there was a, this one to one correspondence. Between number of equal that time uh, to scale field. So making scale field uniform or scale on, 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 on some hypersurface is a perfect, perfectly uh, well defined a uh, gauge condition. So so that's why a uh, you can take this slice. An important point of this slice is that if you consider, for example, a end of inflation and when the inflation ends and damp distribution begins and uh, the heating occurs and so on and so forth. These will be directly uh, uh, dominated um, um, by the, uh, the value, value of time derivative of the scale field because all these, all these uh, physics, a uh, 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 the heating physics, uh, occurs inside Hubble pack, inside the horizon scale, and which means that everything is determined by local physics, and, and it should be a, independent from large scale choice of large scale physics and uh, coordinates and so on and so forth. And and it's it's uh, fairly easy to see because the, all this a uh, 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 physics we discussed, the heating physics we discussed is determined by the value of the scale field itself. So the heating or the, uh, the universe, the uh, heated universe uh, is defined, I mean, the homogeneity is slice. Slice of homogeneous uh, phi or the, when it is reheated, the slice of homogeneous temperature will be a space of, uh, a space, spatial Slices will be is the slice where the the, the scale field is homogeneous, or after scale, scale field uh, disappeared, it will be the uh, slice where the temperature is homogeneous. Now, of course, on that slice, the curvature perturbation, the spatial curvature will be non-vanishing because uh, in the beginning we constant some fluctuations. About uh, this fluctuation dividing in the flat slicing. But in the end, universe 
is homo a, a uh, homogeneous in temperature on slides where the curvature is non vanishing. So, so this is kind of an intuitive picture, and and then so this means that you have to do a, con a gauge transformation from one slice to the other, and and then it turns out this is fairly simple to do. Then you can, uh, uh, and then for for definite this I I put this a C a for the uh, curvature perturbation, but anyway the point is that. <coughs> Uh, once the scar field fluctuation given on flat slicing, then you can you can compute the uh, curvature perturbation on commuting slice by this gauge transformation. So knowing this, you find this. Now, of course, you can do this the gauge uh, transformation at any time. During the inflation, as long as the scale field is dominating the universe. But it turned out most sort of a, 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 a convenient a, a time to uh, do the space transformation is at the time when the scale cross the horizon. Okay. So, hmm. so this, this is actually a, a determined by this uh, the conservation equation. Uh, I, I don't have time to derive this. I guess maybe later I can uh, discuss more detail about the, uh, how to uh, derive these equations. Uh, but yes, I, I think so. But <laughs> here for the moment, just, just let me just uh, uh, write down a, 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 a the equations of motion for the model function for the uh, this curvature perturbation and uh, where uh, this in commuting slice in the curvature perturbation commuting slice the uh, uh, follows this equation where this the uh, friction term usually this if there are no uh, non-trivial sort of uh, scalar field dynamics or anything then you would expect this to be scale factor square. Uh, by the way, this prime is a, a uh, Conformal time derivative. But anyway, uh, the point is that uh, the curvature perturbation, uh, because it sort of couples to the uh, uh, a scalar field, or, or maybe maybe you could say that uh, because of uh, this relation that if you assume this, uh, this this satisfies the some some massless scalar field equation, uh, then you have this additional sort of a factor. But this is slowly varying as we, we see we, uh, in in the case of slow roll scalar uh, inflation. So essentially, the equation for scalar field. I'm uh, sorry, the equation for the coverage of elevation and co moving size uh, look, must look similar to the equation for the delta phi, but uh, with some, some corrections due to this time variation of H over phi dot. Now, this is exactly the case uh, if you. <coughs> uh, uh, if you look at this equation, then. then uh, as, as you see, a, apart from the scale factor square, which, which is the case if if uh, there are no the uh, effect of uh, this this uh, pi dot over h, but because of this the uh, correction uh, the relation between uh, c, which is essentially uh, maybe I should maybe write in this way. This may be that's simple that phi is Apart from some sign, uh, it's pi uh, dot over h times rc. So, so if this satisfies uh, almost a, 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 a massless scalar field equation, 
then you expect this to satisfy the similar equation except for this factor. And it turns out this factor appears only in this uh, neutron time. And, and <clears throat> so, so and, and you can, and, 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 and the, uh, we define this H epsilon, sorry, not epsilon, H, H, H to be H, H dot over H square. Now, and, and the, <clears throat> then you can immediately see that this, this is given, uh, this, this is equal to uh, uh, phi dot over two uh, H square. This was the definition of the, uh, this one of the uh, zero parameter. And using this equation, you can just rewrite this in this option form. Now, <clears throat> so, so, uh, and, and the, the, and the important thing is that, uh, oh yeah, so here, yeah, and this is related to this thing. The important thing is when you take k goes to zero limit, again, you have a, a uh, term, uh, the potential term, this term disappears. And you will have have the solution, constant solution. Now, this equation uh, uh, it's, it, in the previous uh, slides I, I, I discussed this uh, delta phi equation in flat slicing in some kind of a intuitive uh, sort of a way. But so it was actually a, an approximate equation, and uh, it, this approximation drops down when k goes to zero, exactly goes to zero, but this equation is valid for any k. And therefore you can take this equation, uh, k equals to zero limit uh, rigorously, and then you find part of from this one decay mode, which should decay very rapidly because uh, g square is proportional to a square times epsilon, epsilon, uh, and that's uh, epsilon uh, is very rapidly in changing and, and the standard inflation epsilon is again almost a constant. So, uh, so in this case, the, you, you can immediately you know the decay mode and you end up with com, in constant mode. So this this uh, a region where actually you can ignore the decay mode and curvature perturbation becomes constant is called adiabatic limit. Uh, uh, it's, I'm not exactly sure whether <laughs> this is a very good terminology or not, uh, but uh, this is what the people say they use. <clears throat> anyway, the point is that so in this limit, when means that when the uh, the scale comes outside the horizon, this becomes a constant. So this means that as we we just knew that they are uh, just delta phi on flat slicing and then the coverage operation on commoving slice is given by this relation, which can be you know, evaluated at any point. So let's just evaluate that on, on Hubble horizon crossing time. In, uh, up to that the time, the, uh, this uh, previous approximation, so, uh, Approximation that uh, this uh, this approximation this the approximation uh, or yes equation this approximate equation is completely valid inside the horizon because as I said inside the horizon you can essentially consider the expansion of the universe the adiabatic uh, quantity uh, to be treated like adiabatic process. So that uh, at each moment of time, you can regard uh, a, a physics is determined solely by physics on some given background, expanding background, without concerning, without ignoring the perturbation in the metric. Anyway, so so because of this relation, you you can uh, easily compute the amplitude of coverage perturbation at the rising crossing. And then we know that the horizon, that the, that the after the horizon crossing, this quantity is conserved. So, so this means that what 
uh, we obtain at any time later, as long as the scale is uh, well outside the horizon, is given by a quantity at horizon crossing, but in terms of the star field and H and Pi delta. So, so this is what uh, you obtain. Uh, and, and then, then you can compute the spectrum of the curvature perturbation uh, uh, by just just evaluating this curve. And, and we know, for example, in, uh, by the way, yes. So we, we know delta phi square uh, in, in the previous uh, is given by h square h over pi square. Which again we, we estimated in previously. And, and now we, we just evaluate this at rising crossing. So this is k, maybe let's say tk, tk, tk. So you can just estimate this at this. Now, <coughs> Anyway, so this is then this is the formula you obtain, and and uh, in terms of this uh, epsilon parameter, you can you write this in this form as well. So essentially, the important point is that the, the curvature perturbation is uh, in if, if there are no sort of a particular parameters in theory, you would obtain some quantity uh, amplitude like a uh, Hubble parameter. In, uh, square uh, divided by Planck mass square. But importantly, in the case of a curvature perturbation from this uh, scalar field, infrared field, you have this additional enhancement factor that is comes from epsilon. So this gives right to a, a large, it can give rise to very large perturbations in, in the scalar perturbations. <coughs> now, uh, Although very weakly, but this perturbation sort of a spectrum can depend weakly on this uh, K. Uh, so, so and, and this weak dependence can be computed by taking uh, derivative with respect to the uh, value of the scalar field and so on and so forth, and using this uh, relation between epsilon and beta and so on and so forth, then you, you find this index ns minus one which is defined in this form this uh, this is rather unfortunate that a, a from some uh, a uh, historical reason the power spectrum in the curvature perturbation is given in terms of this ns minus one uh, <clears throat> uh, but anyway and then when ns equal, equal one this becomes purely k independent but uh, and, and this is a, a, when there is some weak k dependence, you may compute this weak dependence, and which in the in terms of the potential you can write in this form, and which is given by this eta v and epsilon v parameters. And as I said, uh, because in the standard law equation, this must be much smaller than unity. Therefore. It is very close to a NS equal one, which is the scale invariance, but slightly deviated from scale invariance if uh, uh, due, due to this uh, eta and epsilon dependence. So this, a, 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 um, in addition to the amplitude of the, the perturbations, you have very important information from the curvature perturbation spectrum index. <laughs> And, and they, uh, here, the, everything, all the discussion was on uh, the simple uh, uh, so called uh, uh, canonical scale field, meaning that uh, so, so if you introduce this x as a, a actually twice, maybe, maybe as well, uh, twice the uh, kind of term, then in the standard case, you have the standard Lagrangian, which is one over two x 
minus potential. This is the standard a, a, uh, canonical star field, uh, sorry, to Lagrangian, but you can uh, generalize the, this to so called K inflation type, mean that the, you may have some very non trivial dependence on the kinetic energy. But, uh, and actually, the kinetic energy can involve uh, some non trivial function of phi and so on. It, it can be quite general. In this case, these people, Galia, Galiga, and Mukhanov, uh, could, could be um, computed the, uh, as uh, derived, let's say, sorry, derived the uh, equation uh, for the curvature calibration, and uh, they find essentially the same uh, formula, uh, except for that you now have a slightly different. Uh, uh, um, uh, you, 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 you have, sorry, sorry, you have some extra uh, sort of parameter which uh, corresponds to the sound velocity. Uh, uh, so the, uh, if you uh, write the action, which was produced by them, uh, it, it uh, has this form, this the curvature parallelism prime square minus Cs k square. In, in the standard canonical case, this will be one. Uh, but uh, in, in, uh, in this general case, the CS can be anything. And of course, if, if it is larger than one, it uh, sort of uh, becomes problematic. So uh, usually you would uh, assume this to be less than one. Anyway, now given this, they, we can actually uh, quantize the system. Now here, a, uh, a, the, the things are a bit, a, so, so I, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is that the, I'm trying to explain what I have done until now to, to put in a more uh, rigorous language and, and make everything more clear and uh, clearly, I say, everything uh, explicit. Okay, so once you have given uh, this action, uh, derivation action is a bit uh, complicated sort of a thing. So uh, I uh, let you, for example, take a look at these people's paper and so on and so forth. But anyway, the once you have the action for this coverage evaluation, now when you quantize, you do the standard uh, procedure that you first introduce canonical momentum by Taking the variation of the action with respect to the time derivative of the uh, variable. And here it is this given by this. And then you impose the uh, canonical communication relation between these two variables. <coughs> so, <coughs> and, and then uh, for, uh, so for each, the, the, oh, this is uh, for each k mode, I think it's each k mode. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, doing sort of a, a, a k, each k, a, what do you call the, uh, uh, I forgot the first. Anyway, the uh, so quantization for each k. So this is on, on each k. Anyway, for each k mode, you, you have this annihilation and uh, yeah, FOP representation, huh? uh, the annihilation equation operator and a mode function. And uh, as I said, in the early universe, the mode function should uh, arrive at some expression which must be a, uh, has a, the same as the flat space mode function. In our case, uh, if the CS is one, it's the standard sort of a quantum field theory mode function. But uh, uh, you can, you can uh, easily uh, derive this formula uh, by using the fact that this pi r is given by this this relation and <clears throat> and uh, uh, yeah a fact, a using the fact that a, a this this canonical uh, commutation relation of this is delta huh? Okay, so 
using this relation, you, you, you arrive at the, uh, this expression. And since uh, 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 here, the, it essentially, you assume that the uh, model function behave exactly like a standard flat space positive frequency model function. We call this algebraic vacuum. And uh, in the case of the space, this algebraic vacuum model function is called Bunch Davis model function. Uh, Bunch Davis. Sorry for doing that spelling. <laughs> yeah, well, usually people uh, just say BD, uh, Bunch Davis vacuum. Uh, so, but but in general, uh, I mean, the universe may not be pure this star, and may, may not be very close to pure this star. As we discussed uh, in the very the first stage in the uh, previous lecture, that the uh, only thing we need is that this, you have the accelerated universe. I'm oh, sorry, the, the other way around. Positive, huh? Accelerated universe. So, so this acceleration doesn't have to be a, a exponential. The one a important maybe is an example is called a, a, a power of inflation, where this a, a is proportional to the power p, but p if the p is much greater than one, then uh, you have a very a rapid accelerated universe. So in, in such a case, you cannot define bunch Davis vacuum because uh, bunch Davis is defined only for this space. But uh, we still have this, uh, this, this, this definition is very general for almost any, any space, uh, a homogeneous and isotopic space, you can always define adaptive vacuum mode function. And so, uh, <clears throat> So, so this is more general, but anyway, in, in the, uh, this is the behavior you find. And this behavior determines the uh, amplitude of the power separation. And it's now you, you can do the exactly the same approximation that you just assume this is valid until rising crossing and uh, estimate this at the, oh, by the way. So uh, if you assume the universe is quasi the Jitta, in terms of the uh, commu uh, 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 conformal time, can be very well approximated by this equation, uh, where the conformal time actually is bounded from above. So, you, if you remember the uh, discussion about the horizon problem, horizon problem occurred when uh, you had finite past in conformal time. But in, in that sense, the, the uh, distal space actually is infinitely, uh, uh, there's no lower bound in the conformal time, but it is bounded from above. Because in reality, this eta can never arrive to zero. Before that, you, you, your inflation ends. But anyway, a, a, during the say inflationary stage, very often this is a very sort of a good approximation. Anyway, so assuming this approximation is valid and you just take time where k equals j, then it, it uh, uh, sorry, no, no, sorry, no, no, in this case, instead of k equals j, which is the horizon, you have now cs, so sound horizon, it's called sound horizon. This is called sound horizon. Sound horizon. Uh, so at, at the time when it is, uh, after it, it uh, uh, becomes, the uh, scale is greater than sound horizon, now, now they become uh, uh, frozen. So you can evaluate the amplitude of the curvature perturbation at sound horizon crossing. And uh, of course, you don't really have to do that if you solve this equation rigorously, then uh, you can get a rigorous 
expression and which is again tells essentially tells you the same amplitude. So anyway, and then you, you travel all these uh, formulas uh, here, then then you find now the in place of uh, essentially this was this was the epsilon parameter. So the, in place of uh, this one of epsilon, now you have the uh, factor CS. So meaning that uh, uh, you may have, and usually CS is less than one. So for this uh, non-trivial kind of uh, 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 in flatten case, uh, you have a extra enhancement due to a non-trivial non sound velocity. Extra enhancement with the coverage of this. So that's the uh, very interesting feature of this model. Okay. <clears throat> now, let me just uh, uh, touch on this delta N formula, which I actually I, I have given a, a series of lectures on delta N uh, this summer. So, uh, uh, in case there is some still remaining some, some lecture notes or something from that lecture, then uh, you can take a look at it, or maybe of course you can ask questions. But the important point here is, is that uh, if you, for example, in the case of this, this is first uh, noted by Savinsky in uh, in uh, Sardius in 1985, that if you consider this number of equals, again, as I said, number of equals taken from some time t until the end of the equation, and, and the, we, we write this uh, as a function of phi, because there's one to one correspondence, the d phi, d phi dt is a pure function of uh, phi. So, so this means that you have the one to one corresponding. So, so you can rewrite dt by dt d dot d phi dot, uh, which means this one. And then if you take the variation of n is less to this phi, okay, and then and, and consider some small sort of a variation of delta n, uh, n, uh, a, Due to some small variation of phi, initial value of phi, then you find this formula exactly since this is lower values, you have the minus sign here, and, and because of this h over phi dot here, and this becomes just a phi. And this is exactly the formula of the relation between the flat slicing delta phi to the co moving slice curvature parameter. So, this was uh, a, a uh, noted. This was uh, noted by Slavinsky. This and and so of course for the single field uh, slow learning inflation, this uh, sort of procedure is essentially unnecessary. But important point is that a, a, as uh, as I'm stating here, you can actually generalize this to a multi-scale field case. Uh, meaning that so here I assume that there's one to one correspondence, meaning that uh, there's single clock, in, uh, the clock uh, inflation is dominated by single clock. But actually, even if you have many square fields, uh, you get essentially the same formula. Same formula is uh, known to hold. And, and, uh, and so rather more in interesting thing is that the uh, this can be generalized. So, so uh, the point is that now you have this some scar field, which has many degrees of freedom, maybe. So you say you can set some value A. Then you can consider fluctuations of scar field in on flat slicing, and, and then you subtract let's say the background value, and this is the delta n for, um, for uh, sorry, for that, I'm writing again, uh, it is defined to full nonlinear order in this uh, part. And, and the whole point is that 
you can do exactly the same procedure for this sort of a multi scalable case. Uh, and, and assuming you know the function, number of equal the formula, then and, and evaluate this data phi on flat slices. It was important that this relation between this, this two is for data phi must be evaluated on flat slices, while the uh, curvature parameter is convolute slice. So this is a flat slicing data phi. And, and if you evaluate that on, on the horizon crossing, so you call it H, then this will be a nonlinear generalization of the curvature formation. And, and uh, so it can uh, play a very important role when uh, estimate, for example, some non Gaussian P or some nonlinear effect in, in the uh, Initial, uh, or maybe primordial black hole formation, for example. <clears throat> okay, so so this is what uh, you obtain. <coughs> oh, by the way, so uh, uh, as 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 uh, this is just a formula repeating again the, what we have discussed. So. The important point anyway is that once you know the number of equals formula, if this is number of equals for the background trajectory, that's important. And then uh, for, for a given number of equal formula, you can take a derivative of number of equal is specific to the to the sum of field, scalar field, which plays a role in this uh, in the inflation. And multiply by the uh, the amplitude of fluctuation, which is essentially given by this formula for if the scalar field is. Oh, by the way, yes. So the, there's interesting assumption that uh, 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 so all these scalar field in this formula, all these scalar field which plays a role in during inflation is uh, the mass of them is uh, all so mass of the, all the scalar field. Is assumed to be much more than h square. And this is a sufficient condition because in this case, uh, a, a, any any potential or any combination of potential or the, any any uh, uh, dynamics uh, should be a slow rolling. For, for so all the all the scalar will be slow rolling and which uh, justify this formula. And if uh, some of them becomes heavier, then uh, uh, actually you cannot really talk about this. But in those cases, what people usually do is sort of uh, you appeal to this effective. Well, it's not exactly the effective field theory, but it's similar to this. But the, when you have some star field which is much greater than mass, you just integrate out. And, and which is uh, in many cases this this is a uh, quite uh, justified and and so uh, so they do not uh, explicitly appear in the dynamics of background but uh, they they they, they uh, contribute to the dy dynamics through sort of an integrated effect, like uh, effectively changing some uh, a, uh, value of some, some scout, uh, not, not, not small mass scout field interaction strength and so on. Anyway, so, and so it's in the end, so again, it's more very important point of this data in formula is that only knowledge of background evolution is necessary. So. Uh, only thing you have to know is to solve the background evolutions for any complicated uh, theory of uh, the, uh, inflation and estimate the, the amplitude of fluctuations in scalar field at the rising process. And that gives rise to uh, this uh, coverage of validation. Mm. Okay. Uh, now, let me just. Uh, Talk about this uh, tensor perturbation. <coughs> so, as I said in the beginning, uh, the tensor perturbation essentially 
uh, in some sense is much simpler. Uh, by the way, a, a, a tensor here means that the tensor in term in the scale of a, sorry, sorry, a, a spatial component. Huh? So a, a, just is a, a, assume a, a, your, your fluctuations uh, satisfy this transverse traceless condition. Uh, and and uh, a, a, in other words, I mean, if there are no other fluctuations, this, this may be regarded as a gauge condition, but uh, in the current case, because we, we have this scalar field, and so we, we have so-called scalar perturbation. Now, a scalar perturbation and tensor perturbation, if you write down in terms of the, uh, by the Fourier decomposed them, then you needed to see that the in term in the action they all decouple, meaning that the, so, so if you if you start from some action which is essentially the Einstein action plus some scalar field action and expand to to the second order. Uh, first of all, that vanishes because of the equations. Uh, uh, satisfied by the background, but uh, you have this some some second order fluctuation. Uh, this this will be essentially given in terms of the uh, this the TT the effect action for STT, which is given here, and, and they, they are decoupled there and the, and the scalar part. Okay. Uh, at least in the uh, this second order in the part of this, or the uh, in, uh, in second order in action, meaning the uh, linear part of this theory level, the action is completely de decoupled. So, and uh, decoupling occurs because you use one side, you assume this uh, TT, uh, uh, metric partition, TT part of metric partition to satisfy because this is the condition for the transverse process. Yes. Anyway, <clears throat> so is this definition uh, 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 you can commentary quantize tensor field. Now, to quantize tensor field, again, uh, usually it's better to make the kinetic term coefficient of kinetic to one over two. And, and this can be easily done by a, a uh, sort of a multiplying this uh, 32, square root of 32 pi g, uh, or in terms of Planck, uh, reduce Planck mass, uh, just uh, Planck mass, uh, just associate Planck mass to this HIJ, then this, this becomes a, this is a, 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 some canonical, canonically normal tensor field. <coughs> then you do the standard sort of a decomposition in terms of the uh, uh, polarization in this case, uh, because you have the tensor modes, tensor modes has a, a uh, it's the same same as the gravitational wave, and actually this does become gravitational waves later time in, in, the, in the evolution of history of the universe. But anyway, so here we have two polarization. Usually it's a plus and plus. Uh, uh, plus and plus plus means that the it's a, a oscillation. If if the this is popping popping space perpendicular to the a, a, a propagation direction, then uh, you have the uh, mode which is oscillating like this cross way, and one the other mode is oscillating like this cross. And this, these are two modes, or maybe you can just consider some uh, this is right moving or left moving, which one is right? <laughs> right. <laughs> sure, but, uh, you, you can that you can consider some example of this. You add i, and uh, this will uh, plus minus. Huh? And if it is plus, then this here, this makes minus. So, uh, some some holistic, you can define such a uh, 
uh, polarization. Anyway, this polarization tensor can be given given the, the, the k. So so if you have the direction of k, you introduce uh, two uh, 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 orthogonal vectors, so which e by e and p. And and, and uh, this this will have this uh, example this the uh, plus will be and it's the two e one i e one k minus e two i e two k something like this and and. Uh, for cross time is similar, I mean, it's mm -hmm. anyway, it, it should satisfy this, these two conditions. <coughs> oh, so, so uh, in, in K space, this means this is just this derivative is just K. Huh? So, this pass the uh, this uh, the polarization tensor should satisfy this and uh, this choice. Looks And, and so you can you can write you can write in terms of this uh, explicitly in terms of those uh, vectors uh, unit vectors perpendicular to the direction k anyway and then then you find that this mode function actually they satisfy exactly the same as massless power field equation and which means automatically that if you compute the amplitude of fluctuations then uh, yeah, if you want to compute the power spectrum, let's say for the, uh, the, uh, the tensor spectrum, then using this formula, you can rewrite this in terms of the, some uh, a, uh, canonical field and, and uh, uh, you know, with some correction. And this canonical field we know uh, is given by the amplitude of this uh, two pi h over two pi square. So, so you end up with having a, apart from this factor a, essentially you end up with the uh, amplitude of the this tensor perturbation very similar to the case of scalar field, except for this one over epsilon factor. Now you don't have this. So this means that the, from the uh, Pure gravitational point of view, uh, uh, so the, you expect some fluctuation amplitude, which is essentially given by the, the uh, curvature scale of the universe divided by Planck scale, which is a uh, very well expected result for any any uh, theory of gravity. So, so, so this is what you get now. <laughs> Important thing is this tensor to scalar ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you if you recall that this uh, tensor to scalar ratio uh, is sorry uh, is scalar perturbation, then scalar perturbation uh, had this a uh, 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 formula which is which can be written in terms of. Uh, uh, the uh, delta n formula and, and uh, uh, this is sort of generalizing the uh, delta n formula to some uh, arbitrary kind of time, arbitrary uh, scale field, multi scale field. But the point is that the, this uh, this is essentially very close to a one of a Planck uh, mass square uh, epsilon. Yes. So this is this is what you obtain for scalar field, and and for tensor one it's definite. You have this one one over a, a, a mass a Planck mass square divided by Planck mass square times eight, and and uh, so which is what you get. Now, 
the important thing is that as if you assume this sort of a, or approximate this power spectrum for tensor modes to be to have this k to mg power it, now in for the gravitational wave you don't put this minus one but anyway so any mg equals zero will be the scale invariant spectrum this will be the scale invariant ah so so this spectral index now is related to the time derivative of this Hubble parameter during the inflation and actually it's given by qh dot over x squared uh, and we know that this is just ipsum parameter so this is ipsum uh, is it just ipsum no? so 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 it's important that a, a, a now given the ipsum the uh, the spectral index is uniquely determined by the uh, the, uh, uh, the slow roll parameter ipsilon. I mean, another important thing is that this is positive for most sort of a sensible, uh, healthy theory of uh, gravity. So this means mg is always negative, meaning that the red spectrum means that the spectrum uh, decreases when, so if you write this k, and if you write a p, then, then amplitude decreases for towards large k. So this is a very, very important property of the tensor fluctuations coming from a standard sort of inflation scenario. Anyway, if you use uh, a relation of this Ipsilon to the Sapphire square and, and uh, use some sort of, uh, what do you call this, Schwarz, inequality or whatever, then you find that this actually is always a uh, greater than this value and which is a actually if you recall this formula is the ratio of the uh, gravitational uh, tensor perturbation amplitude to the scalar perturbation amplitude. So, <coughs> so in the end, <coughs> And, and actually, this equality holds for single field. Equality is equal equal for single field. Single field inflation. So anyway, so so this this ratio, the a, a tensor perturbation spectrum divided by scalar perturbation spectrum is defined as R. It's called R, it's tensor to square ratio. And uh, so for uh, this, uh, essentially the theories uh, which are a, in some sense standard, so that they, you may have some non-trivial, uh, some scalar field, but uh, as, as long as the gravity part is a, a standard gravity or maybe it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, within some uh, uh, class of standards, class of scalar tensor theory, then, <clears throat> then this is always equal or less than the, uh, this uh, uh, eight times the uh, uh, spectral tensor spec spectral index, and which is uh, actually given in, oops, so eight is missing, huh? So it must be 16, so <laughs> yes. So the Ipsilon. So, so uh, this is a very important sort of a consistency relation. And so if we are lucky enough, we, if the amplitude of the or the Hubble parameter is large enough so that uh, this amplitude of uh, the, uh, the tensor perturbation is large enough to be detected in near future, then we may be able to have a chance to, to, uh, to uh, check whether this uh, a consistency relation for the standard uh, slow roll inflation is just uh, valid or not. And that will have a, a profound effect. Okay. Uh. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. I sounds like that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you said this equality mm -hmm. is valid for the single field inflation, then yep. 
what I mean, how, how to understand, uh, for example, I add more fields, more inflaton fields, then this PG mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, is it's, it's, kind of suppressed. Or something. Yeah, 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 it's, 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 it's very simple. Huh? So, so the, uh, the uh, tensor perturbation is independent of a uh, scalar field. Huh? So, uh -huh. so you always have this. No, yes. and, and it's just single or I mean, including the a uh, a polarization is two degrees of freedom but anyway so you have just two degrees of freedom for uh, for the tensor spectrum but for scalar you can add huh? you can add more yes you may have um, some scalar field, one scalar field which has h over two pi square yeah but you may have n scalar field oh uh, yes? i see Yes, uh -huh. so, yeah, and, and scale too. And then you just divide by each one. Huh? <laughs> so, so this <laughs> this just number uh, is, is just here. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a very trivial kind of a <laughs> fact. But as the, if you include the number of scale here, you decrease the tensor to scalar ratio. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so maybe for the remaining five minutes or so, let's uh, have questions. Oh, by the way, yeah, maybe I should finish this. Huh? I think I may have some summary. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, sorry, no, no, I, I got more, <laughs> sorry. So, this is the comparison observation, and uh, probably I don't have time, so let me just go through the uh, actual data. So, so here, people, this is a famous kind of a picture first included by uh, WMAP people. And on the horizontal axis, you you, you plot the uh, primordial so perturbation tilt NS. So NS equal one. This is the scale invariant component, and uh, as you see that NS is red. So that's one of the important sort of a fact that it is about 9.65 or something and according to recent five results. And, and this tensor to scale ratio, of course it, it is defined by this uh, P tensor divided by P uh, S and which depends on K, it can depend on K. So, and and so so you have to fix the k and here they fix the k to 0 0.002 uh, megaparsec so the uh, this k is chosen to be 0 0.002 megaparsec inverse which is about the horizon scale of the current universe anyway and and the current sort of a a, a result indicates that the uh, tensor to scale ratio at least on this scale and if uh, it is almost scale invariant this doesn't change much is below let's say 0 0.07 or so 0 0.07 for, for uh, one sigma level and uh, but the, the, the built primordial tilt is very much tightly constrained and, and if you Consider various type of inflation, uh, inflation model. Here's power inflation, R square. This is for the Stravinsky inflation. I may have time to mention this tomorrow. A standard phi square, maybe a, a, this uh, some fractional power, uh, linear, and something. And all these different models, you, you draw a uh, possible. A, uh, a, Uh, predictions, then, you, then, for example, if you consider a, 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 this sort of most simplest prototype model, uh, phi square, m square, phi square potential case, then independent of the, uh, the this, this, this is the difference in the number of equals. I think this is, um, this is 50. And if the number of equals increases, it goes down, but it cannot go down too much. Anyway, so if you change the number of e-folds, then uh, this changes this region. But point is that these this predict the amplitude of tensor to scale ratio 
about 0.15. And this was a completely, almost completely excluded, maybe three sigma excluded by the current uh, 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 observation. So, so this is a very interesting and important sort of concern. And right now, so if, if you, for, for example, want to consider some inflation model, you have to be careful that the model should satisfy at least this concern. Mr. Yeah. Yes. You, you're, you're still on slide 27. Uh, I, I've got a feeling you're sharing something else, or you think you're sharing something else? Oops, sorry. Uh, you're not sharing this. Uh, I, 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 I thought that I was sharing this uh, CMB constraints, but uh, you're not seeing that? I'm seeing the CMB power spectrum, the temperature power spectrum. Oh, oh something's wrong. Oh, I don't know. What? Do you see that? Oops, no, no, the other way. No, Compar uh, comparison. Um, we're on page 27. Maybe I should uh, stop sharing first and uh, show again. Sorry, sorry about this. That's okay. Something's wrong, right? Okay. Yeah, there okay. we go. Now you see? Now we see, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I, I'm very sorry. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah, doing something wrong. Anyway, so what I was saying that if you take a look at this B potential phi square model, m square phi square, so the simplest, and which was a uh, quite popular in the uh, until they uh, say early to year uh, 2000. Uh, in this model, you predict amplitude tensor score ratio, scale ratio 0.15 or so. Yes. This 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 dif this difference is number of equal difference. So this is number of equal cases. And this, of course, number of equal is different if you consider different a uh, a, a a reheating mechanism. But uh, this cannot go down too much. Number of cannot increase too much. Can decrease, but if you decrease, you go further and further away from the uh, 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 this. Uh, observed value. The point is that the this this model can be it can agree with the primordial curve and s and s is like 0 0.965. It's very tightly constrained, but anyway, it can match. But the amplitude of tensor federation is way behind uh, above the uh, constraint level. The uh, constraint level is about 0 0.07. And so, so it's it's a more than two sigma, or almost two sigma exclusion. So, 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 so this is a, a important sort of a, a sort of uh, things information you should know. And then, uh, so let me just summarize. Just say. Miss Sir, I think you muted yourself, sorry. <laughs> sorry, again, now no, I, I muted, sir. <laughs> you're, you're okay now, yeah, <laughs> thanks. Oh, I'm very sorry, I'm so disorganized. I, so, but the, the okay, they, anyway, it's, it's time, so let me just summarize. So, so this, this figure, anyway, it suggests, of course, there are still some sort of a simple, fairly simple model that satisfy this constraint, constraint that the coverage evaluation uh, tilt is like 0 0.965, and there is the tensile scale ratio of 0 0.05 or less. But the uh, <clears throat> point is that they, they maybe, maybe inflation may not be so standard. So maybe we have some uh, various other Sort of things to take into account, like that. Like what I just briefly mentioned this case of multi field. Uh, as, as I said, the multi field event usually is suppress the uh, tensor to scale ratio. So it's a natural result that the uh, R is small. So you may have some non small inflation, some other type of inflation, so suppose. And another thing is that although this plant people didn't detect so the non Gaussian key of the perturbations, 
but uh, the, the, the standards of the single period slow rolling inflation predict so called this FNL parameter, it's the second order, sort of uh, the leading order non Gaussian parameter, uh, is much smaller than order unity. It's, it's almost negligible. So essentially, it's zero for single period standards slow rolling inflation. Now, if so, if this is found to be order one or greater, then you you will and you should have either one of or maybe something else, something else. And so this is a very very important sort of a quantity to be a measured in future. Also, unfortunately, the tensor scale ratio is fairly small, zero point zero five or so or something. Uh, but still. Uh, now, the, uh, there are lots of effort to go down to 0 0.001. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how far you can go, but up, up, up to this value, it seems that it's possible to detect the uh, tensor, uh, the tensor uh, modes. And so, uh, so that effort is going on, and in the near future, within maybe five, 10 years, may be detected. And if this is detected, it means uh, they are, it, it determines the uh, uh, scale of inflation. So we are really living in a very interesting, exciting stage. Well, actually, I, I'm, I'm maybe a bit too old to see the actual result, but uh, for you young people, definitely we see within 10, 15 years time, know all these predictions uh, seen or maybe excluded it and so on so forth. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Masao. It's very nice, thanks. Uh, so we've, we're have we about on time, well, about just over time, but if you have any questions, then please uh, ask them in chat. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yep, so a question, so I'll, I'll ask it. Uh, so why do we expect the universe to be dominated by a scalar field during inflation and not some other field? Oh, uh, it can be, but, but the, the scalar field is the most natural. I mean, if the uh, scalar field, scalar field, since it doesn't have any, contain any directional dependence, anything, scalar by definition, so it, it can uh, most easily or smoothly uh, recover or uh, realize the uh, homogeneous and isolated universe. That's the most important reason. But you may have some vector field which dominate uh, if you sort of cook up some uh, model. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? So. I have a, I have a question in the meantime, I suppose. So, so FNL. Uh, is generically predicted, uh, so it's, it 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 will be present even in single field inflation, right? It'd be very small, but there will yeah. there is a term. So, do you think there's a reasonable chance that we could actually measure FNL and, and to the to the accuracy where we can get it, we can predict single field inflation, or is it just too low? Oh yeah, yeah. Single in the case of single field inflation, it's too low because. Uh, as it is the award of this NS minus one. Okay. Uh, FNL. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so this is, and we know this is like 0. Uh, 0.0 something, huh? <laughs> yeah. That. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so, so uh, observationally, I don't think it's possible, but order one can be, huh? Yeah. So, this means that if we actually detect order one, you kill the single field in case. Mm. That's why it's very important. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I see some uh, in the chat. What is this? Or oh, the uh, same question? No, same question. Oh, okay. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, sorry, I, I, I want to ask a follow-up question about my, yeah, just now, my question just now. So uh, actually adding more fields, we uh, we, we are actually adding uh, iso curvature perturbation, right? We, we cannot simply times n on the, 
Yeah, yeah. So, so it's the question I asked just now. So, uh, yeah. by adding more inflaton fields, the, yeah. the, yeah, you said the power spectrum, scalar power spectrum, uh, is like by times n or something. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I think we we cannot simply do this because, uh, not all of them are I I mean adiabatic. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's why it's, it's important how it depends, right? I mean, so, uh, so, so everything is in this formula. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yes, so, yes. So, yes. how, how, you know, you have this uh, n, n depends on this uh, each component of the scalar field, and they, uh, for some scalar field, which is as you say, it's very much like isoclavature, then uh, this dependence becomes very weak. Okay. Yeah. So, so you yeah. want to want to do it. But, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the point, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just want to confirm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Okay, any more questions? I think we're done. I mean, there, so we'll be back here tomorrow anyway. So if you have any questions, you can ask, uh, you can ask uh, also tomorrow. Uh, okay, and we're also uh, a little bit over time now. So yeah, so I think we can close the session now. Uh, so thank you very much, Miss Al, for those lectures. They're very interesting. Uh, great job. And so we'll be back at 2 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, Korean time in Japan. Uh, same time. So, yeah. So, so thank you very much, Miss Al. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. I'll see you tomorrow.